Many years ago when I was in middle school, I w went to bed just a, a normal evening. You know, just go to bed and, you know, just thinking, waking up the next morning, what was on my agenda that day on Saturday was to go play baseball at the rec department in Franklin County. I was excited about it, uh, going to go there and play with my friends and try to win the game. And I woke up that morning, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but I woke up and my eyelids were sealed shut. Couldn't open my eyes. And so I began to freak out as a middle schooler, probably 7th, 8th grade. I mean, I freaked out big time and I started doing everything I could to, like, to open my eye. And finally one of them popped open. And I rushed to the bathroom and I looked and all that yellow crud was everywhere on my eyes. Disgusting, nasty, and I couldn't open my left eye. And finally, after w washing my face and getting that stuff out, I opened the eyes and my eyes were super red and swollen. And so my dad took me to the eye doctor, Dr. Newman Blackstock here in Roanoke, I believe at Tanglewood Mall, and I went in and everything seemed to be fine. It was just some allergies. Um, and, and I asked the doctor, I said, listen, can I still play in my baseball game today? <laughs> the only thing that was on my mind. And he said, yeah. Anyways, I, I say that to say this, that, that I thankfully am not blind. I can see out of both of my eyes. I do have to, I do require uh, glasses and or contacts. And in fact, if I do not wear my glasses and contacts while I drive, it's illegal because my vision is that bad. But I say all that to say this, that in our text today, Jesus Christ encounters a man who was born blind. But when this guy met the Lord Jesus Christ, his life was forever changed. Today, I want to label my thoughts with these words. Jesus Christ can heal the blind. Jesus Christ can heal the blind. As I was meditating here in this passage of Scripture, I began to think about a lot of different things. And by the way, today's not going to be a normal sermon. I'm just going to walk through the text. I don't really have points or anything like that. But I do have some things I want to share with you from this text. And one of those things is this. When Jesus steps into your life, it will be forever changed. When Jesus steps into your life, my dear friend, it will be forever changed. And as we come to this passage, we find Jesus Christ walks into the life of a man who was born blind and his life was forever changed. Imagine not being able to see and then at one moment in your life being able to see everything. How life would radically change. But in our text, in verses 1 through 7, we find the scene. In fact, there's a couple different scenes in this passage. In 1 through 7, we find the scene where Jesus answers a question of the disciples and then heals the blind man. And then verses 8 through 12, we find another scene in the same story where the individuals in the town see the blind man and they said, Hey, is this the man that begged and was blind? and now he sees and then verses 13 all the way to 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 pretty much verse uh, number 38 we find that that the blind man is brought to the Pharisees and they question him and one of the things they questioned him was about how he was healed and then the other thing was about who it was that healed him and what he thought about the one that healed him. And then the rest of the chapter deals with Jesus Christ talking to the blind man. Now, in verse number 2, we find that the disciples asked a question. And they asked a simple question. Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, it was a common belief in the Old Testament and in the Pharisees' faith uh, concerning parts of the Old Testament that, in fact, you know, there are times in life where we are stricken with an illness because it is actually a disease that God sent to that person as a judgment. But then there's times where it, it isn't God's judgment, it's just a part of life. And, and here we find that, that, the, that the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, who sinned? Was it the blind man or his parents? And he said, neither of them. So sometimes in life, disease just happens because it is simply a part of life. And here, blindness is a part of life. There's numerous people that are blind today just because of a genetic issue concerning their birth. And we find here in verse 3, he says what he says. And then he says, but the reason why this man was born blind, I like this. 
that the works of God should be made manifest in Him. What happens to us doesn't happen to us for us. It happens to us for Jesus. What happens to us does not happen for us. It happens so that Jesus can be glorified through us in the manner in which He makes Himself manifested. In verse number 4, the Bible says that Jesus says, I must work the works of Him that sent me. So He was sent by God the Father to this earth and to do God's works. And nobody else is able to do these things. In verse 5 says that Jesus, He said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Going back to chapter number 8 where, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall uh, not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then verse number 6, it says, and then that after this, he spoke these things. Jesus knelt down on the ground, spat on the ground, grabbed that dirt, which, by the way, that's all we're made of is dirt. The only difference between the dirt out there and the grass is and the ground is that we have the breath of God and life in us. Yeah. Scientists have taken our bodies and have tested them and discovered that, that we were actually made from the dust of the earth. And here he takes that dust of the earth and he anoints it, places it on the guy's eyes, the blind man's eyes, and he says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And so this guy goes to the pool and he washes his face and instantly he received his sight. And now, verses 8 through 12, we find that the city began to realize, hey, this guy looks a little bit different. He's walking around as if he, as if he can see. And so they begin to question and all these different things. And, and right here in this part, I just wrote in the margin of my Bible, I said, when Jesus steps into your life, you'll be forever changed. Can you imagine being, being blind? Can you imagine not being able to see at all? That would be hard. It would be very hard. That's right, Dwayne. It would be very hard. Now, as I envision this guy sitting on the side of a road begging for help, I am often reminded of the individuals on 419 there in Tanglewood who are always standing there with signs and, and all these different things. And, and uh, sure, some of them may be legitimate, but they may not be legitimate. But here in this case, this blind man was legitimate, but Jesus stepped in and transformed his life. And so they asked him, and, and what happened? And he told him that this guy named Jesus took clay, anointed my eyes, and said, go wash in this pool. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. Amen. And then they said unto him, where is he? Speaking of, where is Jesus? This man named Jesus. And, and he said, I don't know. And now verses 13, pretty much down through the majority of the chapter, we find a discussion with the blind man in front of the religious Pharisees of his day. And they bring him to the Pharisees, verse 12, 13, and uh, who was aforetime blind. And uh, now you got to understand what really upset the Pharisees was the fact that this all transpired on the Sabbath day. Verse 14 says it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And verse 15, the blind man speaks uh, after they asked him how he received his sight, and he tells them how he received his sight. Hey, for the second time, he tells a story. He says, I went... Uh, I, I met this guy named Jesus. He put clay in my eyes and said, go wash in the sea and uh, wash in the pool. And then I received my sight. And therefore, some of the Pharisees responded in verse 16, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. I put a box around this in my, pa in my Bible. And I put in the margin of my Bible, I wrote this word, legalism. One thing that is stricken within Christianity, just as if it was in the days of Jesus when He walked on this earth, is this concept of legalism. Now listen, you, you realize that the, the Pharisees added so many more laws and concepts to the Levitical law than what was required of them. And today... In modern Christianity, we have added extra laws to the law of God, thinking that if we follow these extra things, we are more holy and righteous than somebody else. But I'm here to tell you something that what's really destroying Americanized Christianity is legalism in the churches. It's pushing away young people. It's pushing away people of all ages and sorts. And just like in this day, 
it pushed people away. But I want you to notice that this is what the Pharisee said. He said, he's not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Now, you got to understand, picking up dirt, spitting in the dirt, putting it on somebody's eyes, is not breaking the Sabbath day. There's no working involved in that. But notice what the other said in verse 16. How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? So they said, hey, how can this man named Jesus do this if he's a man like you and me? And the Bible says that there was division among them. And ever since this day, there's always been division about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there will always be division about Jesus Christ throughout the rest of human history. But to understand a proper, a proper understanding of who Jesus was, you need to read the Bible, not somebody's opinion about Jesus Christ. This book right here is the Word of God, and it reveals who Jesus Christ was because it's the inspired and Aaron infallible Word of the living, resurrected Savior, Jesus Jesus Christ. And then verse number 17 says, they go on and they, they said to the blind man that, that what, what sayest thou of him? He that has opened thine eyes. And he said, so they asked him a question about Jesus and, and he responded and said, he is a prophet. And oh, it really made the Pharisees mad. Notice verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. Do you understand this? They did not believe the testimony of this blind man. They did not think that he was a four-time blind. They thought he was lying. And so, it says, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And now, the Pharisees call in the parents of this blind man. And they asked them and said, is this your son who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? And then his parents answered and said, we know that this, this, was our, this is our son and that we know that our son was blind from birth. And they said, but, but we don't understand how or by what process he now has received sight, but he has received sight in verse number 21. But I want you to notice this in verse 21. It says, he is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for thyself or for himself. In verse 22, the blind man's parents said all of this. They, they said, he is of age. Ask him because they feared the Jews. Now, I've read the Old Testament. Probably many of you have too. I've read the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, you know what it says about fearing man? It says the fear of man brings a snare. It's like a trap that will trap you is what a snare is. And it is far better to fear God than to fear man. And here they were so afraid of what the Pharisees were going to do because if they confessed that Jesus was Christ, that He was a prophet, that He was a Messiah, then they would shove them and cast them and throw them out of the synagogue. So they were afraid. They had such a reverence for the Pharisees that they were afraid of what they were going to do, all of what they believed about Jesus Christ. Now, 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 if that ever occurs in America, please stand your ground. Speak out. Stand up. Don't sit down and shut up. But stand for the Word of God and Jesus Christ. Because far too many people in Americanized Christianity are sitting on the sidelines and in the pews, not willing to stand up for who Jesus Christ was. Then the Pharisees called the blind man again in verse 24. And they said, hey, you need to give God the praise. We know that this man Jesus was a sinner. And I like verse 25. I believe verse 25 is the second most important verse of this chapter. The most important verse, in my opinion, the key verse is verse 33. But verse 25, the blind man answers this, whether or not this man is a sinner, I really don't know. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. That verse right there, I don't know if you've ever been in the rescue mission, but, but the verse it says, One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see, is in the chapel in the rescue mission. And I'm here to tell you something, that, that Jesus Christ is able to heal those that are blind. This part of the passage deals with somebody being physically healed who's blind. But the rest of the chapter deals with those who are spiritually blind. And Jesus can heal them too. 
Jesus Christ can heal those who are spiritually blind. Now notice the Pharisees respond, What did He do to thee? How opened He His eyes, thine eyes? And here's what the blind man responded. He says, listen guys, I already told you how I was healed. Why should I tell you again? You're not going to believe me. And then verse 28 says that then they reviled him. Now this word reviled, it literally means to bring reproach upon somebody. So then they said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. I can just see them now pointing their fingers and saying, you're Jesus' disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Moses was a great character in the Old Testament. No questions asked about it. God used him in a mighty way. Verse 29 says, We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The blind man responds and says, Why herein is a, mar why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Know we, uh, now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he hears. Verse 32 says, Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? And rightfully so. I mean, can you imagine from this day on, uh, fr from the New Testament here, uh, you, you don't really recall too much in the Old Testament about somebody who's blind and in the receiving sight. And especially in this day, Jesus stepped on the scene, healed not only this guy who was blind, but many others who were blind. And now verse 33, this is, this is a great verse of Scripture. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Think about that. If Jesus Christ is not of God, he could not have done the miracles he performed. And then after he said that, you know what they did? They cast him out. That was altogether born in sins. Can you imagine? The Pharisees thought they, they had this holier-than-thou mentality. That, hey, you're a sinner and we are holy. You were born in sins, we're righteous. And you're going to try to teach us? They were so consumed with self-righteousness, arrogancy, and pride that they could not see who Jesus Christ truly really was. And verse 34 says, and they cast him out. And now the Bible says that Jesus heard about this, that they cast him out, that they threw him out of the synagogue. He comes on the scene, and the Bible says that Jesus asked these, this question to the blind man, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? The blind man responds with these words, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And the blind man responded, Lord, I believe. So here we discover that hey, Jesus Christ healed the blind man physically, and then he healed him spiritually. And I submit to you today that God is able to heal those who are sick physically, but far more important, He is able to heal those spiritually from this disease that we've been stricken with called sin. My question for you today is, can you say these words, Lord, I believe. This term believe means to entrust. It means to have faith in. It means to put one's trust in. And then after this, the blind man worshipped him. What's interesting, when you study the term worship, it gives the same connotation. I say this respectfully. This is what, what's in the lexicons. You can go look it up for yourself. But I say this respectfully. But this word gives the same connotation that as a dog goes and begins to, to, to lick his master's hands and begin to, to worship his master, to serve his master, is the same meaning here in this verse that this blind man did the same thing as a dog does to his master, to Jesus. That he just described worship to him and value and respect and reverence. And today, that's what we're called to do. To serve Christ, to worship Him if you know Christ. In verses 39, 40, and 41, reveal this simple truth. Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
So my question for you today is can you say, Lord, I believe? If you can, that's awesome. That's great. Praise the Lord. Are you worshiping Him like the blind man worshiped Him? Father, we thank